devices and high concentration devices. So most people are using nasal cannulas, right? So the nasal cannula really is only designed to go up to about six liters per minute, okay? So imagine six liters per minute is that the glass is full, right? And anything else we give you, I can give you 100 liters of oxygen per minute. If it's going through a nasal cannula, all that extra oxygen, it's like wine, it's all winding up on the table, okay? And you know, if it were wine, we'd spit it down and suck it off the table, okay? But you can't do that with the oxygen, it's already gone, okay? So that's one thing to think about. So if six liters per minute, continuous medical grade oxygen on a, constant, on a cannula is not doing the job for you, then we have to think about what's the next step. The next step is a mask. Okay, the masks are awesome because everyone's like, I don't want to wear a mask, okay? But the beauty of the mask is that when you're doing this, okay, we're keeping all that oxygen in, and instead of going up to a maximum of about 40% oxygen, we're able to get you up to pretty much 100% oxygen if we could go up to 15 liters per minute. Oxygen in the air is about 20.96% of the total air. But again, with the, with the cannula and a tank, we're able to get you up to about 44 40%, but again, it really, once you're going above that and your oxygen needs are not being met, then we have to either go to a, a different device or much more um, much more liter flow, which a lot of people don't have the ability to go to 15 liters, 20 liters, 25 liters fill. Question, um, your, your feelings about liquid oxygen, part one, part two, your Medicare, how do you get it? It's a big problem. Okay, um, I think that liquid oxygen is great. I think it's got pluses and minuses, the, the fills. I mean, to me, the ideal, okay, the best possible way to get oxygen is a tank. Okay, a tank of pure oxygen. Now that comes with its own problem, okay? It's that you have to keep changing your regulator, you have to carry around this big tank, but let's be frank, okay, at a certain point, not a certain point, I don't want to say as a definite, but if you, you know, the interstitial lung diseases um, are, you know, you can see people with COPD and they never, as a general rule, will need the amount of oxygen that people with the interstitial diseases do. So if you have IPF, we don't see people go from like 95 to 85. We often will see people go from 90 to 60 or 70, you know, something like that. So something like that, you know, the liquid oxygen is gonna be limited in how many liters per minute you get. Um, I think it's great if you can get it. I think Medicare is not, you know, I think the insurance companies are not covering it in the way that they do, which is making it harder for distributors to get it because if they're not getting paid, they're not gonna wanna go through the extra effort. The other thing is that, um, you know, the, the DME companies, the medical equipment supply companies are being choked by Medicare now, okay? And, you know, they can't do it. So if you could find someone who will do it and they get it covered, that's great. But I think also, um, if possible, you know, I'm not gonna lie, we, we live in New York City, we have a, a lot of people with money, we live in, Dallas with people. If you have the money, uh, not everybody does, and that's really unfortunate, but I think it's worth your while to say, well, you know what, I, I should, this should be covered by my insurance, but do you want to make a point, or do you want to live your best life? And I know that not everybody has the ability to say, I'm going to make a decision to purchase this on my own, um, but if you can, you know, you want to get the best care for yourself. The other thing is that a lot of the oxygen companies will give you this concentrator, um, you know, the, the plug-in concentrator, and maybe a portable oxygen concentrator, but maybe the, the plug-in concentrator only goes up to five liters per minute, right? And that's really five liters per minute, but it's not the purest five liters per minute as if you had a tank. I'm gonna let you on a secret. Um, so how much the oxygen company charges your insurance company is very different than what they pay. And what it me, okay, so something that might be charged $75 to Medicare, I could probably get for $10. So I would say this, I would say, if you need the oxygen, so maybe you have a concentrator and Medicare will cover that. And maybe you have affordable and Medicare will cover that. But maybe to really exercise vigorously, you need 15 liters per minute, and you're not gonna get that out of the portable or the plug-in concentrator, you need the tank. Say to your oxygen company, let me ask you a question. If I pay for this myself, not the Medicare rate. They're gonna say, oh, it's 75. Listen, let's cut it, you know, cut the bowl. You probably get it for $10, I'll pay $20. And then you got that tank sitting there that you can use when you get on the treadmill or when you go out for your walk or you do this, okay? You don't have to use it all the time, okay? 
Maybe when you're sitting and doing nothing, the concentrator does something. Maybe when you're going out and driving in your car, your quarter blocks, the concentrator is going to do the trick. But for vigorous exercise, people with IPF need a lot of oxygen. Okay? So say to your con say to your guy, this is what I want. I want 12 tanks every three months. I will pay for them. Okay? And I'm, I'm telling you, if you knew the prices <coughs> that you could get them for and what they're paying for them and what they're billing, you know, your insurance company, it's messed up. Okay, so talk to them and people say, look, this is what I really need. What would it take for me to do this, okay? And again, I know there's people who don't have the money to do that, okay? I feel for you, okay? If you can do it, I think there's people who really can't do it, and I think there's people who have this idea like, nah, screw that. I'm supposed to be covered by my insurance company, right? And you can take that position, and you can say, I'm only gonna take what my insurance company will do, but I think ultimately you're harming yourself. So I think if you can sort of supplement in these ways, but use it smartly. Use it at times when your oxygen demand is gonna be the highest, because these are all about supply and demand, right? So sitting and doing nothing, you don't need much oxygen, right? The more you do. So this takes more oxygen than sitting and doing nothing. This takes more oxygen than what I was just doing. Walking vigorously on a treadmill takes a lot. So all I'm saying is that there's ways to sort of work with the companies, and you know, if I'm paying $10 or something and I can get 20, I'd rather do that than not not do anything at all. And I think there are companies that will work with you if you contact the right people and if you make a personal connection with somebody. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing is, so if, if six liters per minute on a, a pure tank of gas is not doing it for you, you can turn it up. Okay, but turning it up has a problem because now it's, you're gonna go through it more quickly, okay? Um, or you can go to the mask. Okay, there's a couple of different kinds of masks out there. Um, we use something called a non rebreather mask, which is the one that's on your face and then there's a bag hanging down. And you know, the bag is, you know, we were reminded of sort of like those, you know, old, you know, nukes type things put, put this on. But what that bag does is it's actually creating a reservoir of oxygen so that every single breath is giving you the maximum concentration of oxygen. So it's like by getting the maximum concentration of oxygen, you can take less breaths. That's also sending a signal. Remember, I was talking before about the autonomic <laughs> nervous system and sympathetic and parasympathetic. When your oxygen starts to creep down, but like, wait a second, what's going on here? I have a situation, we better increase heart rate, increase blood pressure, increase <coughs> respiration, but by giving you that oxygen, you, we're saying to your body, it's okay, you know? Because like, if I'm sitting here and doing nothing, and all of a sudden I hop up and jump on the treadmill, my body doesn't have eyes, except these eyes. But like internally, my heart doesn't have eyes, my lungs don't have eyes, my autonomic nervous system doesn't have eyes, so, your body doesn't know the difference between running on a treadmill and getting chased by a bear. So unless you give it some signal that everything's okay, it's gonna keep, it's gonna assume you're being chased by the bear and it's gonna throw out all the stops. And from a physiologic point of view, if you get off too quick to start, you're breathing hard and fast, your heart pumping hard and things like that, then you're actually doing other things. Your body is starting to spill lactic acid into it. You know, your body, your bloodstream is becoming more acid and that also is sending a signal back to the brain saying, breathe, 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 breathe. And then we get into the mechanical issue of we don't have that, you know, breath. It's like if I said all of a sudden, you know, it's the difference between like filing out orderly, or if I say, quit, everything out, and we all, you know, bottleneck at the door. It's the same type of thing with your airways, which is why, you know, it takes a lot to really uh, think about, you know, breathing properly when you're using these concentrations. Again, if you're going, all you're doing is going through your tank as fast as possible, okay? But if you take that and go, the lungs are getting, you know, the oxygen's getting into the lungs where we need it, your saturation's going up, okay? It takes a lot to think about, okay? It, it takes an effort to think about it. And it's not the kind of thing where, like, the more you do it, you eventually do it naturally. You don't. You're never going to do it naturally. Nobody breathes like that naturally, okay? But these are things that I say, you know, I give you a choice. Do you have to do it? No, but if you're telling me I'm short of breath, I'm, I have no energy, my legs hurt every time I walk, that is worth it to you, okay? And the beginning is the hardest part, okay? The first three months are gonna be the hardest part. If you can make that commitment for a month, two months, three months, but really, you know, usually after four weeks of doing these changes pretty regularly, you start to see some changes. When you start to see these changes, you say, wow, you know, I, I used to have to stop two times walking up that hill, I just got up the hill without stopping. That's motivating, okay? And you know, you have so many things that over and over again are kind of playing on your head and beating you on your head and saying, you can't breathe and you can't exercise and now you can't, you know, do your own laundry and now you can't go dancing and now you can't do this. And it's like it's like a barrage of things telling you that you can't, 
But in the same way that you spiral downhill by not engaging in behaviors that are positive for you, trust me, you can spiral back uphill. Especially, remember what I talked about before, when I said that you can do more, you're less sure about all these different things, or, or think about the, the work, because more people are experienced with getting worse, so you can be more short of breath, you can be, be able to do less activity, you can have less energy with no change in your lung function. So that's telling us that it's not the lungs, it's all these different things that we're doing and not doing they're doing. So in the same way that you spiral downhill, guess what, start to undo some of these changes and you can start to spiral uphill, but it's not fast, it's not easy, okay? It's not gonna be fast and it's not gonna be easy, but we have one life to live, right? So whether that's gonna be for two more months, or two more decades, or you know, whatever it is, let's live it to the maximum. Let's utilize it, let's focus on it, you know, let's extend the effort. Because what's your alternative? Your alternative is to just sit and wait, right? No one's here because they want to sit and wait. Everybody's here because they're waiting for instructions, they're waiting for orders, right? Well, these are the orders. This is what's gonna do it for you, okay? No ifs, down your buts. The profanidone, the nintendative, that's something, okay? It may do something for you. It may help to slow the progression of the scar tissue being laid down. It's not gonna make you less short of breath. It's not gonna make you able to walk up the hill. It's not gonna be able to make you bend down and pick up your grandchild. The things that I'm telling you about will, okay? Yes? Um, since a lot of people here are immunosuppressed, and would it be easy for them to catch cold or virus? Yep. Um, number one, how to avoid it, and number two, you know, any kind of exercising during a period of illness. Okay, good question. I'm gonna do the last part first because I have another part on specifically preventing infection, okay? Um, so here's the thing, um, exercise. You say, well, I'm not feeling well, should I be exercising? I think when we get sick, this is kind of what it's like. So we kind of get a little sick, a little more sick, a little more sick, then we're gonna hit over the head, we're like, oh, this is terrible. Then we start to get a little bit better, and a little bit better, and a little bit better, and a little bit better. If the most simple way of thinking about it is like this, is when you're rolling down the hill, don't exercise, okay? When you're going downhill, 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 that's the time when every bit of strength in your body needs to be fighting that infection, okay? So that time, could you do breathing exercises? Yes. Could you use your acapella? Yes. Could you use your aerobica? Yes. Those things, yes. But that's not the time to get up on the treadmill. And I think by exercising during the time period that you're going downhill can actually make you sicker <coughs> and slow your recovery. But when you turn that corner and you say, hey, you know what? I feel a little bit better today. That's the time where I think that exercise can actually speed up your recovery and make you, you know, everybody's a little bit different, but in my experience, I think if you're rolling downhill, no. You, you, you eat your chicken soup or whatever it is you do, you take your medicine, you rest. But when you turn that hill, that's the time to say, all right, you know, like that, that getting sick, you're in the penalty box, okay? You're now starting to turn, let's get out there, get back on the hike, you know? Um, so that's that's other things. So let's just any any questions about the, the oxygen because I'm trying to hit it for you. But again, people are gonna say how much oxygen should I use? Use as much as you have, okay? And use as much as it takes to keep you at 93% for you know or more. Now again, if your own devices don't allow you to remain at 93%, then you have to be in a rehab program. You have to be someplace where you can get more oxygen, where you can be monitored because oxygen saturation doesn't exist in a vacuum. It affects other things too. So as I said before, if, if you're low in oxygen, you're, it's gonna increase the workload on your heart. It's gonna increase your heart rate, you know, your heart rate, your blood pressure. It could increase your chances of arrhythmia. It could increase the pressure in the pulmonary artery, okay? Um, so you have to be in a supervised environment where we know you're okay, where you can be monitored, okay? But again, you know, it, it gets tricky because you say, well, what if insurance doesn't cover it, okay? It's a mess. We've got to, we're in a bind, okay? As a nation, we're in a bind, okay? Because you say, well, you know, what we, you know, what I try to get people to understand, I'm, little by little, I'm trying to reach out to local politicians to get, have my voice heard, you know, but the idea is this. Rehab, at a worst case scenario, let's say it costs $100 a visit, which that's higher for some, lower than others, okay? And you went twice a week, that's 200 bucks a week. If you went all 50, if you went 50 weeks a year, you took off for Christmas and Thanksgiving and New Year's, that's 10,000 bucks for the year, right? $10,000 for you to go to rehab twice a week for the whole year. If you go to the emergency room, okay, that 10,000 bucks is gone in the first hour probably, okay? Or if you wind up in the ICU, 
how much does that cost? So what I'm trying to get people to understand is that infection is such a big part. Everything I'm telling you, the medicine, the nutrition, the exercise, the stress, they're all equal. They're huge, each. And you know, there are gonna be other things that people say, like supplement, you know, there's all little things, but, but I think overwhelmingly the five basics are these things that we're talking about now. So I cover frequency, every day, intensity, push yourself as hard as you can, as long as your vital signs are stable. And again, initially, I think everybody should do pulmonary rehab. The beauty of pulmonary rehab is our many, okay? But here's the biggest benefit. When I'm walking in the street, and all of a sudden I get short of breath, and I'm like, oh my God, I can't breathe, okay? And then I'm like, oh, I feel this pressure in my chest, and I say, oh, like Stanford and sound. Elizabeth, is this the big one? You know, I am terrified of that, okay? If I don't know how to swim, I'm not going in the deep end of the pool, okay? It's that simple. So if you don't know if going to the grocery store is gonna allow you to get there and back without you becoming so short of breath that you don't know if you're gonna keel over, okay? Nobody's gonna do that. But again, there's physical things going on, there's emotional things going on, and there's physiologic things going on, and these physical and emotional, they cycle back and forth. So it's like, I'm starting to get short of breath, fight or flight, sympathetic nervous system. My body's saying, oh, am I gonna be okay? This sympathetic nervous system puts out the adrenaline. The adrenaline says, breathe, 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 breathe. But because there's a restriction to our inhalation and exhalation, we can't breathe as much as we need to be breathing. So guess what? We get even more short of breath, then we get more nervous. And that's when you feel like, that's not what we want, okay? But the thing is that the combination of the mental and the physical can either work for you and be your best friend or they can work against you and be your best enemy. I want you to work towards making them your best friend. And the way that we do it is I see, see so many people, it happens all the time, people are walking on the treadmill, they go, oh my God, my heart is beating out of my chest. And I say, how fast do you think your heart is going right now? They say, probably about 140, 150, and I say, would it surprise you to know that your heart rate is only 95? And my heart rate is 95. Well, why am I, why do I feel this? You know, like, okay. Would it surprise you to know that your blood pressure is 170 over 80? And that's okay. Would it surprise you to know your oxygen? So yeah, it feels terrible. You are working hard to breathe, okay? But if your vital signs are good, that's the way you get stronger. And that's the way you become more fit. And that's the way your body gets better at using oxygen. And that's how you change lung function, okay? You don't have to find anyone else in the country. You have to go to Tel Aviv, Israel, to find somebody else who's gonna tell you that you can improve your lung function with exercise. You know why? Because they're tough over there, okay? And because they're doing vigorous workouts like we're doing vigorous workouts, okay? Most places I know about, okay, if you read the class pulmonary literature, they're working people out for long periods of time at low intensities, right? You go into some walking in. 1.5 miles per hour for 30 minutes, 40 minutes. But think about it like this, very simple formula. If this is what your life requires, and I exercise you at this level, you can do that till the cows come home. You never get better at this, right? But if I do whatever it takes, if I give you 25 liters of oxygen on a mask, 100%, and I can get you exercising here, well, that's something different, and now your life gets better. Okay, so I'm not saying this to say, hey, your program is not doing what they, it's not their fault, people don't know about these things, okay? But it's up to you to say to your, re and you know what, this feels pretty easy for me. You think maybe I can increase, and you know, maybe I, if I, could I increase the oxygen a little bit so I could do a little bigger workout? Ask the questions, I'm not here to, to criticize anybody or to, to bad mouth any, anybody, but I'm here to educate you so that you at least know what questions to ask. And if they have questions about it, you could say, well, would you consider watching this webinar? And, and again, you know, if I were just here and I, I'm showing you video, okay, you know it's true. If I were just here talking, you know, and I, if I were just here talking and not, not showing you any proof, but you know it's true. I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna show you another one now because it's, it's a good break. So. Say hi to family and friends. So again, this is armor size. I'm gonna put this on the website. I'm gonna make this available to Bill so that you guys have these exercises. So what this is, a series of 15 different, 16 different exercises, okay? Punching bag, arm jog, marching soldier, and these work. Play at your own wrist.
<laughs> so, so the thing is that, you know, ask the questions and, and let them, you know, the, the webinars are all up. So ask the people, would you be willing to, you know, watch this webinar or call me? I'm, I'll, I'll talk to anybody about this, okay? Because it, it, it just is a, a matter of changing the mindset of the program from this, from slow down to stop and take a break to you're okay, keep going because we have things to do. Okay? If you think about it, if I only exercise you, you know, my goal is to squeeze every single drop out of every single workout. Okay? If I get you for only 24 sessions, you better believe from session one to session 24, and the only way that that can happen, I can't just say, okay, we're going to go exercise. I have to see, okay, Bill, let's see what's going on. So your heart rate's this, your heart rate's that, your oxygen saturation is this, your blood. we can go up a little more. And if that's still pretty good for you, then we can go up a little more. We go, I'm gonna squeeze as much out of each session, because think about it, if I get only 60% out of each session, right? Remember I said Goldilocks, not too hot, but also not too cold. Think about over the course of 24 sessions, how much waste weight there is there, okay? People wanna fight Medicare, they wanna say, we're not getting enough visits. And it's true, we're not getting enough visits, but in the same way that I say to you, evaluate your exercise, evaluate your nutrition, evaluate your stress management, I say to programs, let's evaluate your testing methods, let's evaluate your evaluation method, and let's evaluate your exercise prescription and monitoring, because maybe you're not doing everything that you can be doing for your patient, okay? Nobody's 100%. Nobody's doing everything, not even Bill Vick, he's at like 99.7%. But, but you know, nobody's at the same. So I say, but yeah, we're gonna ask the government for Maybe they're gonna give it to us, maybe we're not. But I say, if the government doesn't give me any food, I'm still gonna feed my family, you know what I mean? And same thing here. So if the government doesn't give me any more visits, I have to work smarter, and I have to work harder, and I have to get more and do more with less. And I would bet that most programs are not doing, you know, the 100% yes, ma'am. It's the same thing with these programs, cash talks. You can get into a program a lot of times. I got into mine for $200. That's a great deal. That's an unbelievable yeah. deal. <laughs> yeah, and not everybody can do that. Okay, but but the other thing is that there are things that you can. Um, you know, I want to prepare you for you if you can get the Cadillac, and I want to you know, prepare you in case you can. You know, you have a bicycle. Okay, um, if you can't get into a program, there's no doubt about it. There are going to be people who don't have the right insurance who aren't getting to get into programs that aren't gonna get the oxygen they need, that aren't gonna get the medications they need, but that doesn't mean we quit, okay? And again, I hate, I'm not even gonna use an animal, you know, I would say a shark thing again, but I, I hate to malign the sharks, but it's like, if the shark bites off one of my arms, I'm still gonna swim with one arm and two legs, okay? Same thing, we have to deal with what we have, and we have to deal with, I'm in New York City, there's people all over the place that are providing care. Here, you have three medical centers in like, if you fall down, you might fall into a hospital. You know? um, but the thing is that um, even if you have nothing, okay, there's people who have nothing, nowhere, no access to a rehab program. Some people I talk to online don't even have a pulmonologist, if you can believe it, okay? let alone an ILB specialist, let alone a, a transplant center. Okay? But I still say to these people, let's start walking. So we'll have, I can only walk a half block. Or right, fine, you can walk a half block, then if you can walk a half block, then tomorrow let's walk three quarters of a block, okay? Don't set the limit, don't say, because I can't walk 10 blocks, I'm not gonna walk two blocks, okay? I, I forget who it is, it's a football coach, and I can't think of who, it, who said it right now, but the, the saying is, don't let the things that you can't do interfere with the things that you can do. I think it's Liz from Bar, that's right, okay. So the idea is that don't let the fact that you can't walk 10 blocks stop you from walking two blocks. Because remember what I said, every little bit that you put in is something. So if you have absolutely nothing available to you, then what I would say to you is um, walking program and armor size, okay? And how do you know if it's okay? Let me show you something else. Many people have probably seen this before, right? This is the RPE scale, rate of perceived exertion. So this means how hard are you working? When you're on the treadmill, I have my vital signs. I see your heart rate, I see your rhythm, I check your blood pressure, I check your oxygen, but guess what? There are people who all those things are great, but they're really in trouble, and they're a couple seconds away, you know. So the way that I say this, I say, how hard are you working? Okay, so the idea, and the way that this came about, and it's interesting, if you look at the top is six, and this is 20, 
There are some programs that will use one to 10. Here's why I use this one, six and 20. Remember I told you that, that peak heart rate is 220 minus your age, right? So if you're 20 years old, then, then your peak heart rate is 200. Add a zero to this, right? If you're if 190, 180. So this, if you think about it as pulse rate, it's a pulse rate of 60 going up to a pulse rate of 200. So that's from least exertion to most exertion, right? But I don't want you to be like, hmm, was it very, very light or very light or, you know, I'm gonna tell you what I ask my patients to say is it, this is where most people are. Is it fairly light, somewhat hard, or hard, okay? And that's what you can ask yourself as you're walking. So you say, well, I'm starting to feel a little different. Well, ask them, is it fairly light, somewhat hard, or hard, okay? Now, if it's very light, or if it's very, very light, guess what? Tell me. Speed up. Not working hard enough, right? So again, remember what I told you, this, you know, this is, if this is my exercise, I'm not gonna get very far. I'm gonna be good at tickling and scratching, you know? Um, but um, if, uh, if it's very light or very, very light, it's too easy. If it's very hard or very, very hard, that's too much. Okay, so you want to be in a fairly light, somewhat hard apartment. So if you think about it like this, as like a ramp or a flight, right? So in the beginning, we're fairly light, somewhat hard, maybe at the top, we're cruising at hard or somewhat hard. And then, you know, you, don't want to, you also don't want to go from fairly light, you know, and you also don't want to go like that. But same thing, you want a nice and gradually, you start your workout, it should be in the fairly light range work up to somewhat hard, the max, the most of the workout should be in the somewhat hard range. And at the peak, for a couple of minutes at the end, that should be hard, okay? And guess what? Over time, what happens is, your fairly light happens at higher levels, okay? And your somewhat hard doesn't come on to a new level. And then we move the goal post. You know what I mean? That's how we do it. So I say to people, each time you come back and tell us that you felt well after the last session, we're gonna give you a little more time, I'm gonna give you a little more intensity. Same with you. So I'm saying if you have access to a pulmonary rehab program and it's paid for, or you can afford to pay for it, that's my number one choice, okay? If you have the ability to come to New York City, work out with us for a month, that's my even better choice. But if you don't have access to anything, that doesn't mean, well, I can't get pulmonary rehab, so I'm just gonna watch TV and eat popcorn instead, you know? So you have to do something, and you can get fit with just a walking program, and armor size and some weights. Okay, you can do it. Okay, it's not as easy and it's not, you know, not, and you still, of course, for all the stuff, should clear it with your doctor and say, am I safe to work out on my own? Learn about the oxygen. Okay, these are complex topics. And right now, we're doing like, we're doing a, a, a doctoral level course in one day, in a couple of hours. And I mean, I could, usually if I teach this to students or, or doctors, I'm teaching it over a six month period. So you have to go back on these things. And, and you know, you're not gonna get it all today, but you know, ask me the question, I'll, I'll communicate with you. Um, I also, am, I'm close to finishing my book, which is gonna be a reference on this. But the idea is that, understand these things. So if I, were gonna, if I have nothing, if I have no rehab access whatsoever, I'm gonna say to my doctor, do you think I'm healthy enough to start a walking program? I don't know. Do you think I need a stress test? Yeah, let's do a stress test first. Guess what? Your heart comes back good. All right, I'm going to start on a walking program. How much should I start at? Don't start at 20 blocks if you haven't walked in 20 years. Okay, start at two blocks. Okay, and here's another thing. I don't know where you live, but don't walk up 10 blocks and then you can't get back. Okay, so walk out a block and then come back a block. If that works, walk out a block and a half. You know what I mean? It's like swimming. Don't go out to that far buoy until you know you can get back the shallow buoy. But then say to yourself, I need to work out in fairly light, somewhat hard, and hard range. So if it means I'm gonna start out, let me start out. Focus on your breathing, the breathing techniques, right? So the breathing techniques are breathing in through your nose, out through your mouth. There are people that will say that you don't have to breathe in through your nose. You don't. I prefer you to breathe in through your nose, but you get some benefit and a lot of benefit from breathing in through your mouth, okay? And then I'm gonna, I'm now I'm gonna get a, a little quicker. Okay, I'm gonna get a little quicker. This is somewhat hard. Maybe again, I'm gonna, you know, really walk fast, or I'm gonna pump my arms, or I'm gonna go to a space where there's a hill. Okay, understand these things, but understand what they mean. Don't just make arbitrary decisions because, well, I don't know. It seemed, it seemed like a good idea. There's science behind all of this, and the science is supply and demand, and that means oxygen use, and that means activity. How your body uses oxygen 
is based on three main things. How good are your lungs at moving air in and out? How good is your heart at pumping blood? How good are your muscles at using oxygen? All three get better with activity. All three get worse with inactivity. So if you have a car and you take perfect care of your car, that's awesome. But if your you know, filter is, is dirty, if you don't use the right kind of gas, and you don't have enough air in your tires, then you're gonna get less mile per gallon, right? But if you change one of those things, it gets a little better. If you change two of those things, if you change them all, those effects multiply. And it's the same type of thing with all the things that I'm talking about today. So the idea is that start these things out, but use it based on science. Supply and demand, just ask yourself supply and demand. So if I sit here, this is more demand than doing nothing, but it's not very much. This is more, this is more, this is more, this is more, you know? So as you do more, and it doesn't matter if it's a formal exercise or if it's cleaning out the garage or carrying groceries, the more physical work you need, the more demand. And that means you have to have more supply. And that supply can come naturally by improving the strength of your heart, by improving the mechanics of your lungs, by improving the muscles, efficiency at using oxygen, or if you can't get it that way, that's where the supplemental oxygen comes in that allows us to increase the supply and so that way we can meet that demand and then it's circular, so it comes back around again so that the body doesn't know you're wearing oxygen, okay? That's another secret. So people have this myth and this idea, they say, well, I don't want to use oxygen because I don't want to become addicted to it. Let me let you know a secret, we're all addicted to oxygen. Okay? You don't get it for six minutes and you're not gonna remember me the next time. You're here, okay? So that's one thing, okay? But by using supplemental oxygen, it doesn't mean you're gonna need it more. It doesn't mean, mean, mean that you're gonna need more oxygen. It doesn't mean that you're gonna need it at times where you didn't need it, need it before. And it doesn't mean you're never gonna get off it, okay? Some of these things are true sometimes. I'm not saying it's never. I'm not, Painting you a unicorn and, and cupcake story here, okay? But let's talk with facts. Let's not talk with BS and let's not talk with assumptions and things that, hmm, it seems like that, but maybe it's not the truth. So if I were stuck in my own workout and I there's a, a, a point that I want to break through, I'll give myself four liters of oxygen and guess what? I just broke through that point and my heart gets better, and my muscles get better, same thing for you. So paradoxically, okay, and it's, it's anti-intuitive, but paradoxically what happens is you're giving yourself more oxygen so you can do more, and by doing more, that makes your body better at using oxygen, so you actually need less oxygen. Fine, let's talk, let's talk quick. What's the time, the, how much time do I have? Okay, so we're not winding up. <laughs> All right, let's put it this way. I will talk uh, if you want. How many people, give me an idea, in 30 minute increments. Do you want a half hour more, an hour more, an hour and a half more? Okay, so when we get to 30, I'm gonna, I'm gonna cover the, the overview in 30, and then we'll go deeper if you want more after that. Okay, so let's go, let's move on. So, so exercise, we talked about frequency, intensity, time, how long should you be exercising? Everything is relative, everything depends upon where you are right now. So if you're doing no exercise right now, don't go out and do an hour of exercise, of new exercises, because then what's gonna happen is you're gonna develop these musculoskeletal things. You're gonna say, and I say to people all the time, listen, people come in sometimes the first day we give them six minutes of arms, six minutes of bike, 10 minutes on the treadmill, oh, I can do much more than this. I say, listen, take it easy, it's a long-term process, okay? It's not gonna happen over day. But the last thing I want, you haven't exercised in 20 years, the last thing I want is for you to call me tomorrow and say, hey, I couldn't get out of bed after that workout, or oh, you, you know, inflamed my elbow, or my bursitis, or arthritis, or you know, all these different things. So take it easy, think long-term. If you add one minute to the, if you can walk on the treadmill for five minutes today, you can walk on the treadmill for six minutes. Okay? So if you were to even add, just as one example, if you start with two minutes today and you add a minute a day, at the end of the month, you will be doing 33 minutes of exercise, okay? So don't think you have to do it all in the first workout. Do it over the course of time, okay? And we also wanna make sure that we're preventing injuries, okay? So that's frequency, intensity, time, and type of exercise. So there's a few different types of exercise. Most important is aerobic exercise, right? Because aerobic exercise is what's gonna help your body get better at using oxygen, 
by improving lung mechanics. I'm gonna keep saying it because I believe it and I know it to be true. By improving the strength of the heart, by improving the efficiency of the muscles, okay? That's things like walking, jogging, bicycle, either outdoor bicycle or exercise bike, bike UBE, upper body ergometer, new step, uh, elliptical machine, swimming, uh, you know, any of that stuff, armor size. Okay, the keto aerobics is it's gotta be at the right intensity and it's gotta be sustained. So, and all of this has to do with science. It's all different metabolism. So, if we do a 100 yard dash, well, let's even start with that. If I put my hand on a hot stove, no metabolism occurs there. I have stuff stored, it's called stored phosphatins that are in my muscles that if I have to put something away, boom, it's, it's, it comes on fast, it's gone fast, right? Then there's the 100 yard dash. The 100 yard dash is, comes on fast, it's powerful, goes away fast, okay? can't sustain it. Aerobic exercise is at a little bit of a lower level, so 50 to 85% or something, you know, 90% of uh, the maximum heart rate that we talked about before, but remember I talked about the theoretical, the actual, and the actual actual, right? But the thing is that it's gotta be sustained. So I would say if you're not doing anything right now, focus on the breathing exercises. The breathing exercises are personal lip breathing, and don't get the idea that because you have restrictive lung disease that personal lip breathing is not good for you. Personal lip breathing is an effective way for everybody to breathe. What it does, it pushes air back, it helps keep the airways open, it helps keep the alveoli, which are the air, air sacs, where a gas exchange occurs open longer, it helps oxygen circulate better. Pace your breathing, okay? So try to breathe. So uh, there's a lot of argument also about What's the best breathing pattern for obstructive disease? What's the best breathing pattern for restricted disease? It's not 100% one or the other, and they're not necessarily opposite. So obstructive disease are things like asthma, COPD, asthma, <coughs> bronchitis, where people have difficulty blowing air out. Restrictive diseases include the interstitial disease, pulmonary fibrosis, where you have trouble breathing air in, right? But if you have trouble breathing air in, you have trouble blowing air out. If you have trouble blowing air out, you don't start saying, like, wow, I'm really having trouble, you know, blowing air out, but blowing air in, that's, that's working out great. Doesn't work that way, okay? So I would say this. What I try to start off teaching people is we have to start with an ink stroke somewhere. And I'm not gonna say, for you it's gonna be five and seven, for you it's gonna be 12 and three. No, the basic I start with, in for a count of two, breathing in, in, out for a count of four, blowing out, two, three, four, so. Okay, but if you really wanna find out what's best for you, okay, and this is a chart that I invented for my book, is write down a list, write a list of, on one side you put one to 10, on the other side you put one to 10. Inhalation, exhalation, and try them all out. That's how you know, okay, how long does that gonna take? 15 minutes, and then we know for sure, as opposed to me saying, I know what's best for every single person in this room, what's the best way. In for two out before, it works for the majority of people. Breathing in for half as long as exhalation works for a lot of people. With pulmonary fibrosis, it's a little more difficult because it's hard to you know, keep that exhalation going for a long time because the lungs want to snap back. But rather than me say to you, here's the, the formula, I would say, take a piece of paper, inhalation, exhalation, one to 10, one to 10. And what I mean by that is, Breathe in for a count of one, out for a count of one, right? We know that's not gonna work because I already told you that we have to get past the trachea. So in one, out one, no. Really, you need to breathe in at least for two, a count of two to get past the trachea. But I would say try in for one, just for the sake of a fun activity, maybe not that fun, but in for one, out for one. How is that? See how it feels. In for one, out for two. How does that feel? In for one, out for three. By the time you get to in for one, out for three or four, you're gonna realize this in for one is not for me. Let me try in for two. In for two, out for one. In for two, out for two. In for two, out for three. You get what I'm saying here? Then if you try in for three, eventually you're gonna to come to something that feels the most natural for you. And the more natural it feels for you, as long as it's keeping your saturation up, then that's the one you should use and understand because I'm talking a lot about supply and demand. Okay, it may change with exercise. So what's good for you when you're sitting and doing nothing may be totally different than when you get up and start walking. What you do when you walk around your house may be totally different than what you do when you're on the treadmill. Does that make sense? All right, so the exercises I talked about, the breathing exercises, aerobic exercise, okay, strength training, very good. Now, for people with pulmonary fibrosis in particular, one of the biggest problems is that the work of breathing becomes so hard 
that you become calorie burning machines to where your metabolism is so high <laughs> just trying to breathe. And that's a problem, okay? And that's a, 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 a problem with um, breathing. It's a problem with maintaining muscle. It's a problem with maintaining fat, and it's a nutritional issue as well. So that's where all these things tie in together. So imagine this. I've heard people say, you know, if you have pulmonary fibrosis or COPD, you're burning 10 times the calories of an average person. I don't believe that, okay? No one's burning 20, 25,000 calories a day, but you're burning a lot more, okay? Now, here's the thing about weight, and I'm gonna transition this into nutrition here, okay? Being the ideal weight is a big help when it comes to fitness and when it comes to breathing, okay? If you're 50 pounds overweight, and depending upon where that weight sits, if I have 50 pounds sitting here, imagine I have a bowling ball, a big bowling ball, hanging off each side of my rib, and every time I need to take a breath, I need to lift that bowling ball, okay? You ever see people whose neck muscles are very developed, their shoulder muscles are very developed, their chest muscles are very developed? Why is that? Because we're, diaphragm's not working as effectively, and we're using what we call these accessory muscles. There's primary muscles of breathing, which is mainly our diaphragm and our intercostal, and there's accessory, which is if we're in a pinch, these muscles can help to elevate the rib cage. But being way overweight is a problem because it's making you do more work to raise the ribs every single time you take a breath. But there's a certain point, okay? There's a certain point in time, and I'm speaking only in theory, I don't get the idea that I'm saying this is going to happen to you definitely, but there comes a point when IPF can progress to where you're working so hard to breathe, meaning that you're taking in less air with each breath and therefore have to breathe 20, 30, 40 breaths per minute, that you're just burning calories all day, every day. And if you're overweight, that may seem like a good thing because initially you're gonna use fat for fuel. But if you don't have that extra fat and you don't have, you know, and it's, it's you see, this is where all these things kind of tornado together. It's like we have Dorothy and Toto, then we see the house, then the witch of which, they're all in here and it gets all confusing. That's why I'm trying to make it simple for you. So it's like, in addition to burning so many calories, another condition of supply and demand is that you can no longer take in as many calories, right? And food may not be as enjoyable because your, 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 you know, your smell and your sense of taste have changed, or you can't take a big meal because when you, you know, take a big meal and sitting here, you have increased resistance to your diaphragm contracting downward and then you can't take a deep enough breath. So it all, you know, you need a strategy for each one of these things. And the key point is if, if, if you need to lose a little weight, you know, then I would say don't make that your top priority. I would say if you're 10, 15 pounds overweight, I would say rather than focus on losing that weight, I would focus on eating healthy and using your body to get in peak physical condition, workout, okay? Getting into peak shape. Now, if you're at a normal weight, okay, or if you're underweight, then you need to make a real effort to hold on to that weight. Because again, if your lung disease progresses, you'll be burning calories that's gonna fall, you know, in the, and you know, again, if you have a lot of adipose tissue, if you have a lot of fat, then that may seem like a good thing. But if you don't have a lot of fat, if you're used to being normal weight or you're even underweight, then the problem becomes, then you have to burn muscle, okay? And burning muscle is one of the worst things that you could possibly do. So let's talk a little bit about what we could do about that. I'm gonna make one more comment on, on exercise, which is that the strength training is gonna help you increase your muscle mass. And you know, Dr. Wong, I think we mentioned it last night, but if not, we'll talk about it. I'm starting to play with the idea of supplementation, supplementing creatine for people, you know, to, to increase muscle mass. But the strength training is going to increase your muscle mass, it's gonna make you more efficient, but then we have to talk about nutrition. So here's the thing, any, any quick questions on exercise? All right, so we've already covered medical and exercise. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get you 30 minute people through the rest of it in, in, in the time allotted. But let's talk about nutrition. So again, Goldilocks, we don't want you too heavy, we don't want you too light, we want you just right, okay? Um, here's the thing, so when most people talk about nutrition, they're gonna, you know, there's three main nutrients, so there's carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, right? Fats have been demonized forever, okay? So a lot of times for healthy eating and heart healthy eating, they'll say, well, you wanna, take these complex carbohydrates and lean proteins, okay? But here's the thing, when you metabolize carbohydrates, so there's, there's two factors here, there's the, the chemical aspect of it, and then there's the metabolism aspect of it. So the chemical aspect of it is that when you ingest carbohydrates, okay, so carbohydrates, particularly, you know, sugars, 
um, you know, bread, pasta, donuts, cake, cookies, all the good stuff, okay? The, the byproduct of carbohydrate metabolism is carbon dioxide, right? Carbon dioxide, when it goes through the blood, sends a signal to your brain, breathe, 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 because we have to blow off this carbon dioxide and we have to bring it on to them, okay? So a lot of people, when they have these high carb meals, okay, people think they're doing a good thing, they're eating pasta, they're eating this and that, um, in order to, to keep the weight on. The problem is that if it's also spilling a ton of carbohydrates into your bloodstream, it could potentially make you more short of breath. The other thing to keep in mind is that when we talk about protein and fat and carbohydrate, Protein and, and carbohydrate each have four calories per gram. Fat has nine calories per gram. So if you're trying to, to gain weight, okay, and for a lot of people that weight gain is crucial. It's gonna be crucial to you, you know, being able to breathe better, it's gonna be crucial to you being able to stay fit. Load up on the fat. And I'm not saying the bacon and the ham, I'm saying there's healthy fats that will actually protect your heart, that will actually clean out the arteries and make you heart healthy. Things like olive oil, things like fish oil, all these things are cardio protective while at the same time giving you more calories. And I also think that these things also reduce inflammation. So if we think about it from an overall decreased inflammation perspective, that's a benefit also. So if you are having difficulty maintaining the weight, I would cut the carbs as best I can, so no breads, nothing or less of it. The breads, the pastas, the cookies, the cakes, the cereals, things like that. Don't believe the hype, okay? These people put a lot of money into making you think they're healthy for you, but you should focus on the, the lean proteins, okay? If you're gonna get your carbs, get them in the form of fresh vegetables and steam them or, you know, make them in, in the healthy oils, okay? But increase your oil intake, increase your, um, you know, your intake of protein, because protein is what builds muscle, and then use the olive oil, use these healthy oils. You can put them in anything and they're not gonna make you more short of breath and they're not gonna make you, um, you know, they're not gonna have this mechanical impact of preventing your diaphragm from contracting downward. But what they are gonna do is they're gonna increase your meal by nine calories per gram. So if you're gonna have, you know, a milkshake, this may sound crazy, but you can put, you know, a, a tablespoon or two of olive oil into that milkshake or into whatever it is that you're eating, and it's not gonna change the taste at all, but it's gonna increase your calorie intake. Again, supply and demand. It's increasing the, the, the supply because the demand is the exercise, the activity, and the work of breathing. That's nutrition in a nutshell, okay? Now here's another thing. I just wrote a nutrition chapter. It took me nine months. It was the bane of my existence for nine months because it was hard to find the right information and every time I thought I was almost done, I found something new. I have a Facebook group. It's available on the Facebook group in our files. Okay, and I will, Bill, if you, if you want, you can make that information available to people. But the chapter is there for free. The book is gonna be available online for free. It's almost done. I've been working on it for almost a decade. It's gonna be done by the end of the year. Okay, it's gonna be on our website, so check back. But the nutrition stuff is so complex, but very simply, Healthy, lean protein. Not the bacon, not the sausage. Yes. Do you know how much you charge me for the book? It's free. It's gonna be free. If you want a hard copy, it's gonna be, it's gonna, you'll pay 10 or 15 bucks for it. But you can read it online for free, okay? Uh, thank you for indicating my lack of money making skills. Um, but, um, okay, so other, so that's the trick in a nutshell, okay? It sounds funny. Speaking of nutshell, nuts, super healthy, okay? And the other thing is that because it's harder for you to breathe, you're not gonna take in three big meals a day. Don't try it, okay? Think of them as feeding, okay? Think of them as grazing, six times per day. Every other hour, you should be putting something in your mouth to feed the system. Nutrition question. I know that sounds short, it's a complex topic, but that's it in a nutshell. Read the chapter that's online, um, and I'll even send it to Bill, so you can, if you don't wanna join my group, it's okay, you can get, get it through Bill. Um, but, um, Questions on nutrition? Yes, sir. Ask a question on the subject. Okay. Um, my family, as far as I know, there's no lung disease that's been present for me. My parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, everybody. I was diagnosed uh, with uh, pulmonary fibrosis several years later. My older brother was diagnosed several years later. My younger sister was diagnosed. Is there any research? There's a, a lot of research going on. I mean, I can't, 
comment on your family specifically, um, but you know, the IPF, idiopathic, means we don't know why that, okay? I mean, I'm sure there are, are definitely, you know, there's pulmonary fibrosis. You can have pulmonary fibrosis and it's not idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. People can develop pulmonary fibrosis as a relation to where they live, to their job, to the type of exposure, to that different things. And then there's people who, no matter what happens, the, the cause is unknown. That's IPF. Question? Doctor, Doctor Christine Garcia at UC Southwestern is doing a study currently on familial IPF. Doctor Christine Garcia. In, in my experience, I've never met two family members who've had IPF. It's just not my experience. I'm not saying it's not out there. Obviously, it is out there. But I've never had two patients that were family members that, that have IPF. Nutrition question. So with that, I would, I would say there's either a huge genetic component that we don't understand yet, or I would look at that community and say what's around there, or where did that family grow up, or what were they exposed to. Nutrition questions, only for the next couple of minutes if there are nutrition. Yes. So we okay. So you know, I'm talking about it from a carbohydrate perspective, okay? But there's a lot of people who have gluten allergies, okay? So they eliminate wheat and they feel a lot better. This goes to the concept of, of, of uh, inflammation. I think inflammation is a huge, huge. I can say it a little bit ago. Huge. Um, it's a huge. Um, it's a huge thing when it comes to disease, okay? And I think you know, if you have inflammation in your gut. If you have colitis, if you have inflammation, you know, why is it that the same people wind up with pulmonary fibrosis and irritable bowel syndrome and uh, hypertension and um, rheumatoid arthritis or scleroderma? There's inflammation and it's so damaging to our system, okay? So I would say this for a lot of people, you know, they have food allergies, they don't even know it, or this food will cause GERD uh, reflux, you know? So I think. It's all worth exploring, okay? You can't do everything. I'm telling you a ton of stuff now that pick and choose. Look at your priorities, you know what I mean? So if you know that every time you eat wheat, you start to, uh, you know, you feel more short of breath or you feel less energy or something like that, then it's worth looking at. It's worth looking into, do you have a wheat allergy, a gluten allergy? Um, you know, because all these things, if, you, if these things cause inflammation, again, I don't believe that inflammation exists in one, any one system by itself. I think if you have inflammation in your coronary arteries, you probably have inflammation in your peripheral arteries. I think if you have inflammation in your gut, I can't see how that doesn't in some way affect your respiration. If by no other reason, then your body's gonna try to deal with this inflammation, and the way to deal with it is by bringing oxygen and healthy nutrients to the body. So I think that, you know, again, that's some, some like, that's where the gastroenterologist comes in. That's where, you know, you can do testing to see, do you have allergies? Do you have, you know, and then you can talk about the idea of elimination diets where you take stuff away and then, uh, you know, you add it back little by little and then you can isolate, hey, every time I eat tomatoes, I wind up waking up in the middle of the night with this. So these things are, are very, very important. One more question. Sure. And you don't have to answer no, I'm not saying that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> No, but we can talk about it for a little bit. You know, I think a lot of times there are people who have cough, okay, that is associated with eating, okay, or drinking or things like that. So you eat, and then, you know, you spend the next 15 minutes coughing. With something like that, I think you have to, you know, again, the gastroenterologist or the pulmonologist to look into what is the relationship. Is there something going on, you know, between your esophagus and your trachea where maybe you're either swallowing air or you're swallowing liquid and it's going into the trachea and into the airways a little bit. Um, I think that's the connection there. And you know, there's ways to test that.